studio in New York City. I'm Julie Hyman, along with Josh Lipton. This is Yahoo Finance Live, and here's what we're watching this afternoon. President Biden and Chinese President Xi Jinping meeting face to face for the first time in a year today near San Francisco. It's a big test to see if the U.S. can steady relations with China, which have been rocky as the two superpowers battle it out over the future of tech, business and much more. And the UAW deal with General Motors in jeopardy. Votes are coming in from workers across GM plants, with many rejecting the tentative contract. Reports say veteran GM UAW members are concerned they may not be getting as much out of the deal as newer employees. At this point, the results will be down to the wire with thousands of votes yet to come in. And retail earnings reaction. Shares of Target soared despite a mixed earnings picture. Revenue and adjusted earnings per share did beat the street's estimate but comparable sales fell for the second straight quarter, dropping by nearly 5% year over year. up to speed on the market action right now you know following the monster rally that we had yesterday josh today things are a lot more muted right we've got the major three averages are trading higher but just like around a quarter to a third of one percent here across the board of the dow gaining a little bit more about 200 points a little more than a half of one percent materials leading gains and utilities bringing up the rear today yeah, we, we did hear some big voices, though, today, too. You know, J.P. Morgan's Jamie Dimon weighed in, talked to another network about how he thought, you know, that reaction we saw yesterday. Of course, there was that post-CPI party that we all saw. Dimon kind of throwing a little bit of cold water there, saying, you know what, I think the reaction was kind of overdone. Said, you know, and his, you know, we're all watching that trajectory, of course, of inflation. It was interesting to hear Dimon kind of talk about, listen, he thinks it's kind of sticky. And frankly, if you think that, then as Diamond thinks, well, maybe the Fed isn't done. Maybe another, another hike, yeah. hike in the pipeline. We're going to get Edgar Denny's take on all this in just a little bit. Dr. Ed himself. Yeah. Yep. All right, moving on. President Biden and Chinese President Xi Jinping currently meeting outside San Francisco in Woodside, California. Xi is making the trip to the U.S. for the first time in six years. So this is, of course, Julie, a, a big geopolitical event. And it's interesting for Xi Jinping because, listen, this is his moment in part to say, one, it's a big, listen, it's a big PR event for him and how this plays back home. But also, of course, he is very sensitive and cognizant of the message he's trying to give American executives, including some who are going to be there, saying, listen, China's open for business. We're still an important market. Mm -hmm. Many of these companies look at China. It's a key link in their supply chain. It's a key end market. They've got a lot of customers there. I'm sure that's part of his calculus here. Can he kind of tell these American execs, listen, we're here. You can still do business here confidently and comfortably. At the same time, you always sort of, you toe that line between the PR event and what's actually happening. Right. Because at the same time, we all see the headlines of the Chinese government raiding offices, detaining foreign execs. It'll be interesting how this all plays. It will be interesting. At the same time, the uh, folks surrounding the two leaders have sort of set the bar low, right? So it's not necessarily expected that we're going to get a lot of concrete agreements out of this whole um, summit necessarily. Um, some of the things that will likely be up for discussion. Uh, one of the things we could potentially get news on, one of the things that has a higher likelihood perhaps, is some kind of regulation from China around the um, elements that go into making fentanyl, which obviously is a crisis here in the United States. However, there's been talk about that in the past and China has not delivered. So we'll see what happens on that front. On the geopolitical front, Taiwan is obviously going to be a big topic of discussion, as is the current situation in the Mideast, um, as is the situation between Russia and Ukraine. So all of that going to be a topic here. Um, the thing that it does look like is going to happen out of this is the two nations are likely to resume military to military communications. Those were halted in the wake of the U.S. shooting down a Chinese spy balloon earlier this year. So we just get talking again would be seen as a big win. Yeah. It seems it seems like at least that's how they've positioned it. Yeah. Yes. If they if they achieve that, that will be a win. It is it is also so interesting to think about kind of the, the tightrope these American execs walk though. Because mm -hmm. on the one hand, they do look at China, for many of them, as a key link in their supply chain. And they do know they they have a lot of customers there. The street always often for a lot of these companies, what's one of the first metrics they make a beeline for us. How's yeah. China business doing, right? So I'm sure some of the execs felt like, you know, we have to be there. 
it is an important market. We can't feel, we don't want Xi Jinping to feel like we're snubbing them in some way. Mm -hmm. at, same, at the same time, they have to be cognizant of all these political sensitive sensitivities, right? And walk yeah. in that tire. I mean, China, Julie, always feels like, to me at this point, it's actually one of the few issues that Democrats, Republicans sometimes actually agree on. So a lot of these execs, they can expect the criticism and they can expect the pushback and they're getting it. At the same time, China also, the economy has not been doing as well as had been anticipated. It's point. really yep. been struggling coming out of its yep. post-pandemic era in a way that many did not anticipate. So that almost takes a little bit of pressure off trying to navigate all the political headwinds if you know, you can turn to, say, India, for example, or some of the other Southeast Asian nations as new markets and new sources of a supply chain as well. I wonder also, though, and you bring up a really good point talking about the economy, so I wonder if the U.S. feels like they go into this with maybe a bit more leverage because of that, in, in that the U.S. economy Perhaps resilient, like yes, relatively, yes. right? And the Chinese economy, how many economists and strategists really felt like, okay, you know what? Post-COVID, get ready for that Beijing boom. Right. It didn't happen. So I, I do wonder whether the U.S. feels like they have an advantage. I mean, at the same there. time, it has been striking. Both sides have made it pretty clear that they need each other, that yep. this is not going to be a long-term permanent split, abrupt split between the two nations. So we'll continue to monitor all of this. We do expect uh, President Biden to be giving a press conference in the 4 p.m. hour. So we'll be monitoring headlines from that. Got to talk about retail today. Target shares soaring on the heels of better than expected third quarter earnings. While investors are cheering the overall news, same store sales were down by nearly 5% compared to a year ago. Joining us now, Michael Lasser, UBS US Hardline, Broadline and Food Retail Analyst. Michael, it's great to see you. Great to see you, Julie. You know, you got to do a double take when you see a reaction like this in the shares. I was looking at the short interest. Is this some kind of short squeeze? I mean, what do you make of a 17.5% gain in target shares? What does that tell you about what expectations were like going into this? Yeah, obviously, it says that expectations were low coming into this event. And now what we're seeing from, from target is that it can manage its profitability even in an environment where it sails under pressure. And so the market is saying, just think about what Target can do once its sales turn. And that's driving the reaction that you're seeing in the stock today. And so, Michael, let's talk about those sales, though. So comparable sales did fall about 5%. Um, when does that turn? What, is, what does the trajectory look like to you? So, Josh, what's happening with, with Target sales right now is two things. One, we all bought coffee makers and vacuum cleaners and televisions during the course of the pandemic. And so it's giving some of that excess demand back. At the same time, Target had a lot of um, excess inventory in 2022. And so it was uh, aggressively liquidating by discounting that, that excess inventory. So as those two factors become less of a headwind to to Target's total sales, its, it's sales are going to stabilize. The long-term story for Target has been that it's a share gainer, and largely a share gainer at the expense of the retailers that have gone away, the Circuit Cities, the Toys R Us, the Bed Bath & Beyond of the world. And that evolution, that Darwinism of retail is only just going to continue. You know, it's interesting, though, Michael. You're, I mean, the stuff you're referring to is sort of what we call hard lines, right? The the coffee makers and such. What about soft lines? What about the apparel, for example? What about those discretionary purchases that maybe aren't being made now? And maybe if the economy continues to weaken, maybe they won't be made for a while. So if the economy does weaken, you're absolutely right. There will be an impact on the discretionary categories. Another way to think about it, though, is if it's tough for Target, as we move into next year, it's going to be tough for a lot of other retailers, like those that um, occupy a shopping mall or other uh, retail subsectors. So in an environment where consumers need to be more value conscious, I would guess that they're going to consolidate trips, especially consolidate trips at retailers where they can buy uh, several different categories. Um, plus, Target's likely to see a trade down benefit. So they'll benefit from trip consolidation, trade down, and some normalization of these categories that had been uh, inflated for the last couple of years. And Michael, you know, another big topic, not, not just for Target, but for retailers, was this issue of shrink, retail theft. How much of an issue is that still for Target now and looking ahead, Michael? And can we, can we quantify the impact? 
So what Target said this quarter is that shrink was a 40 basis point drag year over year. Um, what, what they also noted is that they expect shrink to be less of a drag, in fact, flat year over year in the fourth quarter. It's just as much about the company taking a, a big hit from shrink in the fourth quarter of last year as it is a sign that it's starting to normalize. But what we've seen historically is that shrink is cyclical. And shrink has been a massive issue across retail in for a multitude of reasons, not only because of organized retail crime, but also because of the new uh, fulfillment methods like drive up that these retailers have uh, rolled out in the last few years, plus all of the ex excessive amount of inventory that's been moving through the retail sector. I would think as we move into next year, that shrink is going to be less of an issue. And if that's the case, Josh, Target has the most to benefit from that. Um, finally, Michael, before we let you go, of course, the big rival to Target, Walmart reports tomorrow morning. And in a recent note, you made a really fascinating comparison between Walmart and Apple. Can you just quickly lay that out for us? So when you look back at Apple in the mid 2000s, it was just beginning on this journey where uh, it was harvesting services, things like the App Store and other things that it was selling to consumers. As that became a larger portion of its total revenue, it's multiple expanded. We think there is a very compelling parallel to Walmart at this point. It is early in its life cycle of harvesting high margin revenue streams, like selling advertisements uh, to third party uh, sellers on its marketplace, to sell it, selling its data to a variety of vendors or uh, logistics services. As those por uh, revenue streams become a larger portion of its total, we think Walmart's multiple will trade at a premium to where it has historically. And investors should, should look to, to that as a way to um, generate alpha from this stock uh, moving forward. Michael Astro from UBS. Michael, thank you so thank much you. for joining us today. That was great, appreciate it. It's good to see you, Josh and, uh, and Julie. And looking at another key name in retail, TJX, parent company, of course, of TJ Maxx, under pressure, despite better than expected earnings, a guy in spooking Wall Street, the company warning of some weakness for the holiday quarter. Joining us now is BMO Managing Director, Simeon Siegel. So, Simeon, let me ask you about this. Uh, stock's down about 3% right now. Just what did you make of, of the print, and is the guidance really what's causing maybe just a bit of nervousness from investors today? Hey, good to see you back to back retail analysts. Look at that. Get yeah. to Paul Lasser. Um, <laughs> hey, guys. So I think, listen, there's an interesting corollary to almost everything he just said on the flip side. So here we do have a business that's selling soft goods and they're selling them really well, comping high single digits. They're also comping homes. So on the, you're looking at products that people did over purchase during the pandemic and yet TJ is able to sell them. So I think what we have right now is a company that was maybe overcrowded on the long side. It was just understood to be a compounder. So we're giving a little bit back from what we have gained. But you look, you're looking at a report where they beat the quarter, raised the full year. They gave you, as they normally do, a conservative fourth quarter guide, but they're telling you they're still taking share. Yeah, I mean, Simeon, it's almost the opposite of Target in some ways, right? That this is a company that is seeing growth, but people are looking at the glasses sort of half empty instead of half full. I mean, what do you make of Michael's argument that, you know, if things tighten further economically, that people might want to make fewer trips? And so maybe they're going to buy clothing and home goods at a Target versus also going to a TJ Maxx or a Home Goods. It's It, it was like a fascinating segment to listen to. And, and, Michael, I love Michael. And so listening to him kind of play out this thesis makes a lot of sense. What, what I will say right now, though, is TJ is doing well in this environment. You could make the argument they're the trade down. And so I remember, and Julie, how many times did you mean like, this is reminiscent of so many Peloton conversations where during the pandemic, you think about what was overpurchased and then where did it slow down and how long did it take? TJ is a business that actually at the beginning of the pandemic didn't work because it didn't have e-commerce. But then once people realized, okay, here is this product, it's available to me their stores are convenient and I want to go to them. It doesn't really matter if I'm shopping somewhere else for food. I need to find my way into the soft goods here. And that's where I think when you brought up soft lines versus hard lines, it's important to show that Marmax, right, TJ, Marshalls, when we think about something that sells a lot of clothes, continue to sell a lot of clothes. And so I think people will still go to TJ because of what they offer. And you and I have talked about this a lot. TJX does not sell cheap clothing. They sell expensive clothing cheap. 
So they're giving you a reason to be in their store. It's not simply to check the box on a need. And so, I mean, you have the equivalent of a buy on the name. What, what are the catalysts ahead that investors should have on, on their radar? So I think that if, listen, if they wouldn't have guided Q4 down, if the stock wouldn't have been doing really well, and frankly, I look at the rest of my group, and today is a huge short squeeze day for companies that people don't theoretically like, whereas here is a company that people do, I think that today is an interesting dynamic that I would look past. So frankly, I think the next catalyst is tomorrow, and I, I say that only half in jest, but I think realistically what we need to see is just an ongoing ability for this company to take share. I think that we know as shoppers that TJX does a great job at taking market share from the consumer. But I think what we're finding out increasingly is they're also taking an important market share from the brands, from the vendors. They're becoming a very important destination in the retail ecosystem. This is no longer just a compendium of other people's mistakes. This is a go-to place that if you're a brand, you wanna make sure you're selling into. That's gonna to continue to push up evaluation. That's gonna to continue to push up the numbers. Simeon, when you talk about, um, half-jokingly, the next catalyst is tomorrow, as it happens, one of your other favorite names is reporting tomorrow, um, and that's Bath & Body Works, right? So um, what is it that you like, and are, do the two have anything in common as you look at sort of things thematically this season? So I haven't compared them in the past. I'm sure I could find similarities. <laughs> um, I think BBW, Bath & Body Works, is an interesting, uh, it, it straddles this fence of one of these businesses that's perceived to be a mall-based retailer, generally does not have a lot of, again, you, I don't remember, the notion of the mall is a very different place than it was, and anyone who sells in the mall is therefore structurally negative, not something that I buy into, but definitely something that weighs on the valuations of my group. So BBW is half in that group and then half in the context of it's actually a replenishment business and doesn't matter i don't know how many candles you burn julie but you burn them <laughs> over and over instead of the pair of sweatpants that's still sitting in the closet from the pellet from the uh, pandemic purchase so i think what we are going to increasingly realize is that bath and body works is a moving off mall business that sells something that you want which means they have pricing power at the same time that there's a replenishment nature which makes them a little bit more stable that's a powerful formula now they need to earn that there's a there's been a management not vacuum but a turnover where they need to show the world that what they are telling us they're going to drive loyalty they're going to drive that replenishment and they can retain that pricing power if they can show that then we're going to get even more of a multiple upside. We're going to get even more of an earnings upside than TJX because I view TJ as a compounder. I don't think I'm telling such a secret by saying TJ is a great business. Whereas when you look at some of my stocks that trade at single digit PE, you start feeling like, okay, well, maybe people have already wrote, written their death and that's just not going to happen. So I think what we want to see for Bath & Body Works now is this progression into holiday where they can show you that they're now past that up and down of soaps and sanitizers and candles that people overbought during the pandemic. And now we're actually just getting back to a normalized sense of people are gonna burn their candles and they're gonna come back for more and they're gonna love them and it's holiday season. And that's when you go find your tis the season candle scent. You know what? I am not a smelly candle girl, but now I know what to get you uh, for the <laughs> holiday season, Simeon. Great to catch up with you as always. Simeon Siegel of BMO, thank you. Good to see you guys. We're just getting started here on Yahoo Finance Live. Coming up, deal in jeopardy. Some GM workers are rejecting the tentative UAW contract, but will it be enough to tip the scales? We will talk about it. Also, President Biden in talks with Chinese President Xi Jinping. We'll talk about what to expect from the high stakes meeting and investors cheering positive inflation reports. But JP Morgan chases Jamie Dimon says, not so fast. We'll talk about his recent comments after the break.
We got some trending tickers and movers for you now. VF Corp. We start there. Those shares getting a lift after JP Morgan upgraded the stock to neutral from underweight. The firm also raising its price target on VF uh, and seeing the company's turnaround plans. Uh, reversing the multi-year risk reward profile. Um, at least that's what they're saying in sort of, uh, I don't know, analyst speak, I guess you would call it here. <laughs> right. um, but the analyst there over there, Matt Boss, basically met with the company and is more optimistic uh, to some degree about the leadership of Bracken Darrell, the, the CEO of the company. But VF has been undergoing a lot of tor turmoil. And also, you know, it's going. he's going to a neutral from underweight, so it's not a buy here. Right. But the stock has been so beaten up and so volatile lately that it's causing some relief here. Yeah, and it's interesting because part of this is like is he's looking at the CEO's track record. You know, CEO came from Logitech, let it turn around there, points out that under the, the watch, the stock saw returns of more than 700%. And the CEO apparently saying, you know what? What I did at Logitech, I can be applied here. The playbook can work here as well, which is interesting because Logitech, of course, peripherals for things like tablets and PCs. Very different right? company. It's like, it's like keyboards, <laughs> right? Yeah. Headsets, mice. But that that seemed to be part of the thesis here and, and said, listen, this CEO's come in and so said, I'm going to refocus on the core, right. which, which means vans. Yeah, basically. I mean, yes, right. Uh, you think of VF in the olden days, I guess. You thought about Vanity Fair. You thought about bras and underwear. But now they own vans. They own North Face. They own a lot of other... Um, brands that, that we know and we like. Again, just to give a little bit more background here, this uh, company is also the subject of an activist campaign. They're, they're pushing for some changes there. And back at the end of October, the company withdrew its guidance, removed the president of the Vans brand. That CEO is going to be running in the interim. So a lot of A lot of drama, but as you here. said, it's been knocked down hard because of those headlines. Yes, so. exactly. And moving on to another name here, check out Microsoft unveiling its first custom AI chip and cloud computing processor. Now it's been coming at its annual Ignite conference as the tech giant seeks to reduce dependence on outside suppliers. So stock not, do, not doing a whole lot today, basically almost flat. Of course, you know, listen, it's up about 55% this year. Um, the headline here, Microsoft unveiling a new AI chip. From what I'm already reading, Julie, it's already being tested with its Bing and Office AI products. Also new cloud computing processor here as well. I mean, part of this is what's interesting is the big picture here is, you know, most companies can't bring chip design in house. It's really expensive. But if you're a big tech, your Amazon, your Apple, your Alphabet, your Microsoft, you can. I mean, you've got huge cash piles. Cash is not a problem. You've got a lot of deep pockets. You've got some of the smartest engineers on the planet. So you've got the brain power. And if you're doing this, if you're designing your own chips, again, most can't, but big tech can, there can be some real benefits in terms of possibly lower cost, improving performance, and you're not relying on one supplier. As you said, though, I mean, Microsoft is sort of the latest, but it's not the first of the big tech companies to do this. So perhaps that's not, that's why there's not more stock reaction. I mean, looking at some of the other chip makers today, Intel shares were moving higher. AMD shares were moving lower. I don't think we were seeing much reaction in NVIDIA. So it's not like this is seen necessarily as creating some big ripple effect that is going to change the competitive landscape for chips. Will it make a difference to Microsoft's bottom line if it saves its money? I guess we'll see. Yeah, but we'll investors see. don't seem to be super excited about One it. One to today. watch, for yeah. sure. Moving on, stocks soaring over the past two days as investors digest more data showing inflation is moderating. But for some, it's too soon to cheer. This week's CEO of JP Morgan Chase, Jamie Dimon, telling Bloomberg the Fed may need to do more, saying people are overreacting to short term numbers and they should, in his words, stop doing that. He said inflation, in fact, could prove stickier than we think and it might not go away that quickly. For reaction, we turn to Ed Yardeni, president of Yardeni Research. Dr. Ed, it's great to see you. Thank you. And so, Ed, let me first get your reaction just to Jamie Dimon's comments. Of course, yesterday we had that big Ed post CPI party. Stocks right. were ripping, but Jamie Dimon coming out, kind of throwing some cold water on there, saying inflation he thinks yeah. could be stickier. Maybe there's another hike in the pipeline. What, what do you make mm -hmm. of Dimon's reaction? I, I don't know why he's been so pessimistic for so long. I mean, last May, he was talking about a hurricane coming, he was forecasting a recession. Back in May of last year, he was saying that consumers are in good shape now, but they're going to run out of their excess savings and retrench. Uh, so he's been really a pessimist on the economy. Now he's being pessimistic also on inflation coming down when the markets have rallied, mostly because guess what? <laughs> inflation is coming down. So I don't know where he's coming from. Uh, he's a smart guy for sure. 
I certainly much better plugged in than I am in terms of knowing all the loan demands that are out there and what's going on in, in the economy from sort of the, the ground level. Uh, but uh, from my uh, view uh, up up above here, uh, maybe 30,000 feet above, things look pretty good in the U.S. economy. So I, I don't agree. Um, Ed, it's Julie here. Um, similarly, yeah. you know, yesterday, the enthusiasm that he was seeing yesterday in the markets, we all saw that enthusiasm, broad-based yeah. enthusiasm following the CPI report. PPI seemed to confirm some of that today. Mm -hmm. It felt like maybe it was a pivot point. Do you view it that way? Oh, absolutely. Look, I, I think we've been a, in a bull market for, for stocks since uh, October 12th of last year. And uh, we got to my year-end target at 4,600 by July 31st of this year. So way ahead of schedule, and I was one of the optimists. And I, I thought, well, maybe I'm not optimistic enough, but I, I concluded we might have a correction. And sure enough, we had a 10% decline in the market from July 31st uh, until October 27th. And now I think uh, that correction is over and the bull market's resuming. And I think we started a Santa Claus rally. So. Uh, I, I think there were a lot of shorts. There's a lot of pessimism out there. Jamie Dimon is not the only chronic pessimist. There's plenty of them. Uh, but all, all, overall, the economy just continues to surprise the naysayers because it's been growing better than expected with inflation moderating faster than expected. And Ed, you know, when we talk about the naysayers consensus, I mean, we have a lot of smart economists and strategists on it. Sure. And when they look out to 2024, many think, you know, the Fed is going to stick this soft landing. Um, you know, of course, consensus 12 months ago, Ed, was I think you had a lot of people saying we we're going to hit a recession. So make a sure. consensus what you want. But what do you see in 2024? Are you predicting a soft landing? Yeah, well, I, I started out last uh, th this year by saying that we're in a recession. Um, I, actually, I should say 2022. I said we're in a recession. It's just a rolling recession hitting different industries at different times. And I, f I figured that on balance, the economy would continue to grow, and it's turned out to be even more resilient than I thought. I mean, I didn't expect 4.9% growth in real GDP in the third quarter. Things are simmering down now. They're slowing down somewhat. And I think, you know, uh, there's a lot of people watching the Fed, and a lot of people tend to be very critical of the Fed. Uh, it's almost contrary to agree with the Fed. And I've been a contrarian saying, you know, the Fed may, may actually get it right. Uh, inflation may come down and they may get it without a, a recession. And so next year, I think we're looking at a 2% growth for real GDP inflation, maybe two to 3%. So I'm very optimistic that inflation is going to continue to decline. And in that scenario, uh, the bonds, the bond yield has peaked uh, and bonds should kind of hang around here and stocks are probably going higher. I got 5,400 on the S&P 500 by the end of next year. That is um, definitely a loftier target than we've heard yeah. from some other folks. I mean, as you say, people love to sort of hate on the Fed and criticize the Fed. And they also love to mm -hmm. guess what the Fed is going to do, right? There's what right. the Fed has told us through its dot plot, what it's going to do next year in terms of cutting rates. And there's what everybody's mm -hmm. guessing they're going to do. How do you see that trajectory working out? Well, again, I, I've been kind of agreeing with the Fed's uh, view of things. And uh, back, uh, I think it was in June, uh, they changed their numbers for uh, what they're going to do next year. Instead of uh, four rate cuts, they're now talking about two rate cuts. I, I think that's a very plausible scenario. And I think the economy has demonstrated that it can handle four and a half to 5% bond yields, which is what we have. And that's what we had before the great financial crisis. So we're we're kind of going back to normal, which is kind of refreshing, don't you think? And Ed, let me ask you, and I'll get you out here on this, for investors who are listening right now, as you look at the U.S. stock market today and, and looking ahead out into 2024, yeah. where do you see opportunity, Ed? What, what sac sectors look attractive to you here? Yeah, well, I've been recommending overweighting technology, financials, and energy. Uh, energy has been sort of a plunker here, uh, but I think it'll, it'll make a comeback. Uh, I think, you know, we... The Saudis try to get the price of oil up to $100 a barrel, and I think the market demonstrated that's just not going to happen. China's too weak, Europe's too weak, and so I think 75 to 85 oil is probably what we're going to consolidate. I think that's that energy companies that have cut back on capital spending are going to be able to generate uh, lots of earnings and cash flow on that. Financials uh, have been, uh, you know, looked on with uh, some concerns. Uh, we had a 
banking crisis back in March. Then we had some uh, rebound in the financial stocks. Then they came back down to, during the correction. But if there's not going to be a recession and uh, interest rates are going to stabilize here, I think the financials are going to do just fine. And the technology, we all know the story there. There's a tremendous uh, demand for technology. I think this will wind up to be the roaring 2020s when we look back on it. And it'll be so because companies will use technology uh, to increase productivity, which is uh, a wonderful way to have economic growth with low inflation, real wages going up and profits being strong. And you're Danny, such a pleasure to see you. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thank we you. appreciate it. Sure. Coming up, we break down investing opportunities in private equity. That's coming up after the break. Wall Street extending its rally this week amid more encouraging data on inflation. But Jared Blickery is here with a look at why investors should be cautious with the rally this week. Jared. I'm not trying to pour a cold water on this rally, and I'm going to show you some impressive stats, but it looks like uh, hedge funds are just gearing up for an end of the year rally and perhaps not a lot more. So let's take a look at what's happened, for instance, with the Nasdaq. That is one of the leaders here over the last 13 days. And we're looking at the futures. That is up uh, seven, almost eight percent. Take a look at the Russell 2000. Uh, that should be up even more. Now we're looking at eight percent, and that is only the futures. Now, if we take a look at some of the sector action, you're going to be really impressed by what we see here. This is what's happening today. Here we go, going back to October 27th. Tech, that is XLK, that's up 13 percent, followed by consumer discretionary and real estate. But when we take a look at some of the leaders here, you can see the results are really trouncing what we saw in the normal large cap sectors. ARC, that is up 26, almost 27 percent. Home Builders up 17 percent. KRE, that is a regional bank ETF. That is up 16 percent. Well, then we can look at chip stocks, gambling, cannabis, New York Fang, solar energy, Korean stocks, IPOs, the list goes on. Uh, even meme stocks, you can see those up 13 percent. And when we take a look at the meme board here, a lot of these names just flying. Palantir up 32 percent. Coin, uh, uh, Coindesk, excuse me, Coinbase up 14 uh, percent. Rocket companies up of 28 and the list goes on. However, a lot of these companies are still really downtrodden from the uh, numbers, from their highs that we saw a few years ago. For instance, just taking a look at the ARC components here, here's Roblox up 29% over the last 13 days. If we take a look, uh, we'll, let's go back to the beginning of its IPO. You can see 
off quite a bit from this high here that was almost at 140. A lot of these stocks, if we take a look at how much they're down from their 52 week highs, here, uh, you can see just a lot of carnage. And this doesn't even take into consideration the fact that a lot of the highs were more than 52 weeks ago. So to see a stock that's down 37, like block down there in the lower left, to uh, Beam, which is down 50%, that means uh, it takes a lot more work to get up uh, back to the unchanged line than a lot of investors realize. If a stock goes down 90%, it has to rally 900% in order to get back up to break even. So I mentioned uh, we have potential for a year-end rally in place. Seasonals would, for, uh, seasonality would uh, uh, be accompanying that and would kind of give the impetus for that. Let's just take a look at the Russell 2000 here, which recently broke to the upside. Uh, one of our reporters, Maddie, was taking a look at the Russell 2000 earlier today. And let me just get back to a chart here. It is going from a very oversold level to a modestly overbought level. And that happened in a very short period of time. Uh, we do have seasonality favoring the Russell 2000 into February of next year. So this could have a little bit of a tailwind beyond the end of the year. Uh, but I think the message for investors here is while you should enjoy the rally, and especially if it comes and sustains itself, don't get your hopes up with respect to a lot of these stocks that simply probably won't come back. Ah, momentum. We'll see how far it takes us, Jared. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Well, while we are seeing gains in stocks, private equity has been seeing some signs of a slowdown this year, including, of course, in the IPO space. So where are investors looking for opportunities in this environment? Joining us now is David Musaver, Advent International Chairman and Managing Partner, and Mohamed Andrewala, Advent Global Opportunities Managing Director, Advent International, by the way, private equity firm with $92 billion in assets under management. Gentlemen, thanks so much for being here. Really appreciate it. Julie, thank you for having us. So um, I want to start with you, David, and sort of talk big picture here, because this has been, for lack of a better word, a bit of a weird year in terms of private equity and especially exits from private equity with the sort of rocky IPO market. As we close things out, how are you feeling about it? And just briefly, how are you feeling about 2024? Uh, Julie, I think that's a great way to describe it in sort of a weird and odd year. I mean, in a lot of ways, price discovery has been really difficult in the private markets. And that's largely because of the cost of capital that's risen so much. So you have to look back nearly 20 years to find a five-year um, rate for the 10-year treasury, with the exception of a few years around that 07, 08 time period. And so private market buyers are really recalibrating to try to figure out just how to value uh, businesses in this environment. And Mo, I, I want to get your take on that same point as well, because it's an important one. We could be in here for a prolonged period of higher borrowing costs, Mo. What, what is that going to mean looking ahead for the, the private equity industry? Yeah, it's it's, um, it's certainly the environment has become a lot more challenging since you know two years ago, and and while that creates uh, challenges, I also think it's a lot of opportunity. If you look at the valuations and what's happened to, uh, particularly in the public markets, how valuations have reset over the last eighteen months, there are real pockets of opportunity starting to form. And we're seeing this in a lot of different sectors, especially if you look below the largest companies in, 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 in the US, the big seven, the so-called big seven, it really is a very interesting time because there's some pockets of value that are forming in certain sectors uh, in the US, but also outside the US. As you know, Advent's a very global firm and, and we have a big presence in Europe and in Latin America. Uh, we think there's some great opportunities actually starting to form there. Well, and Mo, um, talk to me a little bit, about, explain to me a little bit about Advent Global Opportunities, what it is, how it differs from the broader business, and what you're able to do that the broader firm doesn't do. Yeah, sure, Julie. So Advent Global Opportunities, AGO, we are the public markets platform of Advent. And as you know, Advent International, you know, 100 billion of assets, it's largely a private equity firm. Uh, but we have deep sector expertise, and we've been chasing uh, investments in the same sectors for 40, almost 40 years now. And so we've developed a lot of expertise in the public markets for the IPOs we've had and, and companies we've bought from the public markets. So eight years ago, we set up AGO to really invest in the public markets with a private equity approach. 
What that means is we are trying to take a, really build a concentrated portfolio of uh, high conviction, high quality companies that has, you know, that we, where we can take a really long-term view, a private equity style long-term horizon and own them for the long-term and let them compound. And David, I also want to get your take on another big issue, which is the regulatory environment. You know, that, that like financing conditions, it's, it's a lot different, David. There's a lot more scrutiny. You know, if industry roll-ups, they're going to get a lot tougher look. That, that tighter regulatory backdrop, David, what does that mean for private equity, not just next year, but in the years ahead? Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's really twofold, but one of the th aspects with a more difficult regulatory environment means that in a lot of ways, private equity may be a more preferred uh, alternative versus two strategics coming together. And so we are seeing situations where um, they might have been a more traditional opportunity, but concerns about uh, a more difficult regulatory or uh, review meant that a buyer wa that wanted certainty uh, might think more uh, in terms of financial buyer. So, you know, it really cuts both ways. But in the backdrop that we see, um, you know, it's been an unusual year as Julie framed. And, um, but it's creating some really interesting opportunities given the environment that we're in. Um, and David, do you expect any thawing on the IPO front? How patient are your investors right now in terms of exits at a time where it seems like it's perhaps not as easy to exit in that in that way, at least? Well, you know, the private equity model is predicated around returning capital. So um, a public market fund is an evergreen structure. So you have a very different context in the way that you think about investments. For us, we've invested about $7 billion this year, and we've also returned nearly a, a similar amount to investors through realizations. And ultimately, that's a really important element for the private markets. Today, you're right, Julie, the IPO market is incredibly thin as we saw from some of the high profile names that came to the market in October that didn't get quite as warm a reception as they had hoped. At the same time, the private markets are thin and there's just a, a much uh, lower level of liquidity across many parts of the financial markets today. So, you know, I think it's gonna be um, some time uh, that it's not gonna have an immediate rebound and we're kind of preparing our companies to be able to operate in a higher cost environment where a 5% uh, tenure is not an unusual thing, but rather something that we've acclimated to. And then you've got to reflect that cost in your capital structure. So we're having our companies prepared for what could be a longer time period to be able to endure this higher cost of capital. That is a really interesting point. And, and Mo, I want to take it to you and what that means for the criteria you're using on the public side, right? You said you got to look below the Magnificent Seven or whatever we're calling them today. Um, are you sort of using that criteria? Who can, who has this staying power in this high cost, high interest rate environment? Absolutely, uh, quality matters, uh, and business quality matters, and, and that you know, exhibits itself in a lot of different ways. Balance sheet, of course, but but a variety of different things around the product, around customer, et cetera. So we spend a lot of time, uh, we, we're old school guys, right? We, we, we really focus on finding that, you know, going a mile deep on one company and really, really getting to, to know them. Um, so, you know, I, I think ultimately it has to manifest itself in valuation and entry price, right? So this higher cost of capital that we're, environment that we're in, uh, ultimately has to lead to uh, valuations reflecting that. And I do think that's actually starting to happen. Um, you have to look beneath the surface because the overall indices don't really show that. But you look at the mid cap uh, space, you look at Europe, you look at things in Latin America, actually valuations are quite attractive. And so if you can find the great businesses at good prices, that can make for an interesting investment um, outlook. Guys, thank you so much. Great to have your insight today. Mo Andrewala and David Musfer, uh, appreciate your time. Thank you thank for you. having us. Thanks. Well, voting is underway over the tentative labor deal between the UAW and General Motors. At this point, the results look like they're going to be down to the wire. Here, break down the latest. We have Yahoo Finance's Pras Subramanian. Uh, Pras, 
this seemed like it was a done deal. Like maybe there were some pockets of trouble, but even in the past day, the dynamics seem to be changing. Yeah, I mean, it's changing by the moment as yeah. we speak. And as of uh, 10 minutes ago, 15 minutes ago, we were looking at the GM UAW tracker. And right now the deal is on track to be ratified as of right now. Uh, had a big plant, Arlington, Texas, uh, vote over 60% for the deal. That brings the overall total to 54% to 46%, as you see right now, with 30,000, 31,000 voters voting, I'm sorry, voters, members voting of 47,000 total GM workers. So there's still a bunch more workers to go. Earlier today, several big plants voted against the deal. They were unhappy with the, with the sort of uh, the particulars of it and showing their displeasure. And it's, it was a concern for GM and also UAW leadership who, who sort of uh, banged the drum on this is a historic deal. We're so happy to get it passed. It's not getting the sort of message that they that they wanted to received at certain at some of the plants. So, if this gets ratified by the majority, are all of the union members still subject to it, or can a particular plant say no? We don't want to do it. It's a simple majority. Once it's ratified, all the plants, all the workers have to abide by this rule. And a lot of temporary workers are very happy with this because they're going to be absorbed into that mix and also uh, get much higher pay, actually more, actually by a percentage uh, point, higher than some of the uh, older veteran workers. And that's sort of the point of contention with a lot of GM workers right now. Mm. Pros, thank you so much for that. Appreciate it. Great to have you on set. Coming up, high stakes meeting, Biden and G to speak face to face in San Francisco today. What can we expect from the talks? We're going to break that down next. President Biden and China's Xi Jinping meeting today after years of rising tensions surrounding surveillance, trade, and Taiwan independence. The two are meeting for the first time in person in more than a year. Talks are still underway. Joining us now is Dennis Unkelvik, attorney, business advisor, and author of Transforming the Global Supply Chain. So, Dennis, thanks so much for joining us. I just, maybe just to start, Dennis, 30,000 foot view, how would you define um, a successful meeting here, Dennis? What would you want to see come out of it? Josh, let me say first that I think this might be the most important meeting between a U.S. president and a Chinese leader since Nixon went to China. Because back then, China was on the bottom. It had lots of problems, and the U.S. was being nice to it, and we created a relationship. Now you have two countries that are more equally looking at each other. So when you say, what's going to come out of this meeting, honestly, I am very, very cautious in thinking that anything significant will come out of this, except in the military area. Uh, Dennis, how, uh, 
how how important is the vibe out of this? I don't know really how else to ask this because, as you say, concrete agreements on specific issues will likely be difficult to come by. But as you say, it's a very important meeting, not because of those specifics necessarily that are expected to come out of it, but because of some sort of rapprochement, right? Julie, I don't think there's going to be a rapprochement. Hmm. What I think you're going to have is China now saying, I'm equal to you as the United States. I wanted to be treated as an equal. I think the U.S. is going to do that. But a lot of what Xi Jinping wants, Biden either can't deliver or won't deliver. Take the Chinese economy, for example. It's really, really in bad shape. A third of their economy is based upon real estate. And as you've covered on your show here before, that's really in the dumps. The long-term answer to this relationship is, I think in the military area, the one thing I would like to see come out of this is this. When Nancy Pelosi went to Taiwan and the Chinese said, don't go, don't go, Xi Jinping said that, she went anyway, we cut off the relationship between the U.S. military and the Chinese military. Now, why is that important? If we had an event, uh, uh, a plane crashes, a ship you know, is, is hit by a Chinese ship, that's when the military has to talk to each other. So if there's one thing I'm looking to come out of this meeting, it's that the two leaders say, OK, we can't solve anything, but let's start there. That would be my top priority. You know, Dennis, we, we've got a lot of CEOs who come on Yahoo Finance. And for many of them across multiple sectors and industries, China is an important market. It's a key link in their supply chain. It's a key end market. They've got a lot of customers over there. When you look long term, Dennis, I mean, you know, five years, 10 years out, is China going to remain a big, large opportunity for Western companies? Or do you think, no, looking ahead, it's going to be smaller, narrower, low margin? I, Josh, it's a great question. I think over the long run, and I'm not talking, I'm not talking about two years, I'm talking about 10 years now. China will become less important as a source for buying U.S. goods and importing from China. There are lots of reasons for that, but one of the reasons is Xi Jinping essentially wants to make Chinese companies dominant. That's why Apple, as you know, Tim Cook was there, I think, two or three weeks ago, and he's not coming to the dinner tonight. When he was there, he was saying, please, let's do more business together. But the Chinese want to uh, Huawei their uh, their their competitor with Apple, they're promoting those. As a matter of fact, the Chinese government announced recently that they're going to encourage Chinese workers who work for the government, that's about 2 million people, to buy Huawei products, not, not those products. So in the long run, I think the U.S. companies have to look obviously to selling to China, but I do not think that they should rely as heavily on China as they had in the past, either as a supplier or as a purchaser. And Dennis, what are you hearing from your clients? Are they are they hearing that message? Are they, in fact, trying to diversify a little bit more away from China? Uh, if you asked me the question two years ago, the answer was no. The answer today is yes. There have been some studies done recently that up to 60% of U.S. companies are thinking about reshoring. That doesn't mean they're going to leave China, Julie, but it means, well, if I'm sole sourcing out of China, let me put it somewhere else. So I think in the U.S., Mexico and Canada, you know, the USMCA, we're going to see lots more companies that are American or North American either stay here or bring some of their sourcing back here. That's what I think is really going to happen. But again, I'm talking longer term. There's no way that any American company can say, I don't want China as a market. I'm not going to do any business there. But over the long run, they're going to have to focus on other industry, other areas like India is a good potential thing. Look at what uh, Apple has done. A lot of their sourcing for their new iPhones is not going to be coming out of China. It's going to be coming out of India. Dennis Arkovic, thank you so much for joining us today, Dennis, for that time and insight. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, Julie. And coming up, closing bell on Wall Street. We're checking in on the latest market moves and the top trending tickers. Stay tuned.
two minutes away from the closing bell. And let's take a look at some of the market action as we close out today's trading session. As we've been talking about, all three major averages are in the green here. The Dow doing the best of the three by a pretty wide margin here. It's up about a half a percent. The S&P up not even a quarter percent. And the NASDAQ is barely higher here as we get to the end of the day. The Russell 2000, which was a huge winner yesterday, up about a third of percent today. And Josh, I just wanted to highlight as we close things out and revisit Target and that just incredible push higher Big that we pop. saw yep. in the stock today, up 18% after the numbers. Yeah, it was a huge move. I mean, nearly 18% there. It's been kind of a rough year for Target in different ways. I think today, you know, it was a, it was a margin story, maybe an inventory story and of course looking ahead we talked to some smart analysts here they see better times ahead too potentially on that topic yeah I thought it was interesting Michael last from UBS saying because of the margin strength at Target he kind of said if Target can achieve the margins it did while seeing falling sales yep. imagine what happens when sales do turn around and he seems relatively confident that that is going to happen now we're getting a little weirdness here on the trending tickers but if I can guess where things are. Maybe we can get to Bitcoin. There it is. Very so I just wanted to point out because I remember what was there. I just quickly wanted to mention what we're seeing from Bitcoin today because even yesterday everything was rallying. It was risk on and Bitcoin wasn't participating but today it's up back above 37,000. You just talked to Kathy Wood about Bitcoin. Yeah, she's seeing 600 to 650, uh, 100,000 as potential uh, number Long to watch bull. there yep. for Bitcoin. Want to switch on over to what we're seeing in the, the sectors today. Consumer staples doing the best, helped in part perhaps by the likes of Target and some of the other retailers. And interested in what's lagging there, utilities. Yeah, utilities and energy down with oil prices. Well, there you have the closing bell on Wall Street on this Wednesday as we see a little bit of a follow through from yesterday's monster rally, but really not huge follow through, right? The Dow, interestingly, the strongest here today, up about 164 points here as we close things out. The S&P up 16 one hundredths of a percent and the Nasdaq up just about seven one hundredths of one percent. We just talked about some of the sectors that are on the move uh, in today's session here. It looks like the Dow having its highest close, according to our Jared Blickery, since August 14th. So showing some strength there. I do find it interesting, you know, are we going to see if 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 some of the strategists we are talking to are, are correct and we're going to see a push higher through the end of the year, is it going to be led by the Nasdaq? Does it have to be led by the Nasdaq and the so-called Magnificent Seven? Or are we going to see a broadening of leadership like we saw in yesterday's big rally? Yeah, well, you know, as rates move lower, you know, big tech can work in that environment. It, did, it was interesting to talk to Dr. Ed Yardeni, though, you know, listen, well-respected, well-known economist and strategist, and he's in that soft landing camp. That does seem to yeah. be consensus here, and investors seem to be getting more comfortable with this idea. It's rare and tricky for the Fed to engineer that and pull that off, the idea that you can bring inflation back to that target, 2% target without a downturn. But it does feel like more investors are getting comfortable with maybe they will stick it. Yeah, we shall see. All right, moving to some trending tickers. Shares of Expedia higher. It's after Value Act Capital reportedly accumulating a stake in the company. That's according to Reuters. Value Act saying Expedia is now set to benefit from smarter pricing. So actually, so Value Act here, again, this is per, per Reuters, taking under, undisclosed stakes in Expedia and Recruit. And, and Value Act apparently saying the two companies were set to benefit from smarter pricing, better cost management, and, and smarter modernization, it looks like, of the services used to run the website. Yeah, but Value Act is busy. Apparently, Very, yeah. reportedly, they are also investing in Walt Disney. And of course, this is not the first activist that has gotten involved in Disney this year. Nelson Peltz's trying capital management has really been the most prominent, visible um, involvement in that company, has been pushing for some board representation, et cetera, throughout the course of the year. Um, but it does reflect, you know, it's interesting about the travel companies. To me, Disney is a bit more interesting because it reflects the dissatisfaction that some investors have had with the company's performance. Yeah, Bob Iger is back, right? He's at the helm, and he, he has been making moves. I mean, we, we cutting costs, cutting jobs, right? Um, but he now, re, he has his hands full. I mean, the stock has not done a whole lot, right? Mm -hmm. He's got his well-known challenges with linear TV. As you said, he's already dealing with Nelson Peltz yeah. um, and his and his firm over at Tryon. They reportedly recently upped their own stake. They're seeking board seats. Now on top of that, he's got Value Act to deal with. Very well-known activist investor. It's engaged in campaigns of other companies, Salesforce, for example. So 
a lot on Iger's plate. But he's a veteran. He's, of course, well used to it. Yes, of course. So we'll see what happens. And we also got to talk about Catalan. That's one of the best performers in the S&P 500 today. It reported better than expected preliminary sales for the fiscal for first fiscal quarter. Baird calling the company's results reassuring after low expectations. By the way, in case you're wondering what Catalan does, yes. this is a company that helps um, bring uh, drugs, life sciences products to market. So it's sort of... Um, and, you know, it, it, it gets that stuff done on the part of pharmaceutical companies. Yeah, just looking through the, you know, commentary from analysts on the street. Mm -hmm. um, Baird, they're, they're neutral. They're a meh. They've got a price target at four. They, they weren't, it doesn't sound like so impressed. They said really the results kind of just exceeded what they would call low expectations. They'll all say, you know, you've got bulls like um, the crew over at Stevens. They got an overweight target of 55. They say, listen, end of the day, this was a clean top and bottom line beat. Um, by the way, Catalan, one of the many, many, many companies that is in the so-called glp averse I'm just going to call it that, right? <laughs> um, this new class of obesity drugs uh, that have gained such prominence, um, and that's because they help, again, bring some of these products to market. So they talked about um, that there is demand from that, but um, it didn't sound like that there is runaway confidence or optimism into what what the fruits of those kinds of drugs are gonna to bring to cattle. And so just right. something to watch though, For sure. within that space. All right, moving on. The M&A landscape has been tough this year, hit by rising interest rates and ever-present fears of a looming recession, but there are signs of recovery now. We saw two mega mergers in the energy sector in October, remember from Chevron and Exxon, and our next guest is seeing some bright spots in 2024. For more, we turn to Mark Cooper, he's CEO of Solomon Partners. Mark, thank you so much for joining us. So, you know, listen, as we highlight there, M&A, there, there's some challenges, rates, geopolitics, there are certainly some still worried about the economy. How does the M&A environment look to you right now, Mark, and, and what do you see as we move here into 2024? Uh, well, thanks for having me. It's maybe what I'm hoping for, uh, and we're certainly hoping for a better market because, as you pointed out in your opening, it, it hasn't been so great over the past couple of years. And this year, again, down, I guess, year to date, 20% versus last year. Last year was down uh, from the year before, although 2020 is not a good indicative year, but if you go back to say the first clean year, 2019, we're probably down close enough to 40%. Yeah, there have been some big transactions. They've been uh, a bit idiosyncratic, uh, not necessarily, uh, in my view, uh, the harbinger of uh, continue or, or growing activity, but have having to do with a lot what's going on, what is going on within their industries. Having said that, though, uh, I am cautiously optimistic that things will open up next year. It sort of feels that way. I can see our own volume picking up, our own backlog picking up. Certainly when it comes to the private equity community, they have to get back in the marketplace and return capital to their investors if they're going to continue to raise capital. Uh, and then I think uh, with interest rates hopefully capping out, uh, there'll be a lot more positive sentiment uh, from uh, from the uh, corporate and strategic buyers. Price is still an issue, and 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 settling on price and what the right price is to clear the market has not been determined in my view. But hopefully that will be the case next year. Um, I'm curious, Mark. It's Julie here. If if you feel like the deal activity is going to come from an offensive or a defensive position, the companies that you're talking to. How do they feel about sort of the economy more broadly and how that's going to drive their deal strategy? So I think it's it, it's offensive and that's what we're seeing. And we're seeing people use this as, as an opportunity to propel themselves uh, forward. Uh, and, uh, you know, from the strategic standpoint, again, from the, the corporate perspective, it is a lot about how they position themselves over the next bunch of years uh, to uh, to gain share, to to be more profitable, to be uh, more competitive. Uh, from a financial point of view, it really is more, or I should say, from the financial buyer point of view, it's more of acquiescing to what is the current reality on pricing. When interest rates go up 500 basis points, uh, multiples have to come down to a degree. Uh, and it's not a question of not having available financing. It's just a question of it just being more expensive. 
uh, and at some point rate uh, multiples have to come down. And once that uh, equilibrium is reached, once that understanding between buyer and seller is is uh, is 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 evident, then I think you'll see uh, you'll see more transactions. And Mark, you mentioned sort of these, these green shoots we're seeing here, some signs of rebound. What, what sectors, Mark, are you, are you seeing there? You know, energy we discussed, but any others? Is it healthcare? Is it financial services? And and where would you expect to see activity? You know, into next year. Well, if, if you don't see it in the biggest segments, you won't you won't see major pickup uh, in the overall M and A markets. And the two biggest segments by far are uh, technology and healthcare, and they've been the two biggest segments that have seen drop off over the past number of years. Uh, and so our, our expectation is those are the two segments that you will see uh, um, a, a greater pickup. But I think it'll be across the board. Again, I think uh, we have to focus on, uh, on what's gone on over the past 18 months with interest rates going up so dramatically so quickly and it putting real pressure on, on, again, what's the clearing price of assets. Uh, and now that that's, I think pretty clear that it's not going higher, and some would say it's going lower, but uh, I'm not necessarily part of that camp, uh, then I think it should create that e equilibrium uh, that would drive, uh, drive activity. Because a big piece of this, you know, the, the, the corporate market has been down, the M&A market, particularly the middle market M&A market, has been down m far more dramatically, almost to the tune of uh, 35 and 40 percent. And that's a big driver. Um, Mark, finally, I want to ask you about consumer related companies in particular. You, your firm has some expertise there within a retail. You've done some deals more recently on that front. We got Target today, which, you know, uh, investors applauding the margins at the company. What are you hearing from that sector, especially as we go into the all important holiday season? It's all about consolidation. And uh, and it's a very difficult retail consumer marketplace. And to win, you, you need to consolidate. We're hearing about a lot of conversations going on. We saw earlier in the year with uh, Coach and Michael Kors. But that's about uh, positioning a company to be, uh, to be a player going forward and Realizing on the uh, on the critical mass of a larger business and the savings and synergies that exist and the competitive advantages of larger of larger groups, uh, and no one needs it more than the retail uh, and apparel world. And you're going to see more of that. Mark Cooper, thank you so much for joining us today. Mark, appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you. All right, we've got some earnings that we are watching. Cisco Systems plunging by about 9% after it came out and cut its full year revenue forecast. The company now says revenue for the full year will be at most $55 billion, a range of 53.8 to $55 billion. It had seen 57 to $58.2 billion. So it looks like that there is a read through here in terms of spending uh, on the part of its clients here. Uh, the company's forecast for the current period also coming in below estimates. As you can see here, last quarter they beat, but analysts are, and investors are obviously really focusing here on the outlook from the company. Yeah, I mean, Cisco, listen, we, we focus on Cisco because it is still seen as, as an important barometer of tech spending. You know, obviously became a Silicon Valley giant, you know, by selling hardware. The switches and routers now very focused on software and services. So analytics and security and video conferencing. Um, I think some key questions on the call are going to be what is the second half of the company's fiscal year going to look like? It's just in terms of enterprise demand. I also think, you know, you're going to have a lot of questions about, remember that big deal they did for Splunk? They announced that back, Julie, in September, $28 billion deal. Bulls liked it because they thought it could strengthen the company's footprint and security. But, you know, there were questions, of course, about execution and, and deal integration. Chuck Robbins here, the CEO, trying to send an optimistic tone in the release, talking about a solid start to fiscal 24, strongest Q run, run results, he says, in our history on both revenue and profitability. But obviously, investors have questions here about the results and the outlook. 
Yeah, and something else that uh, Scott Heron, the CFO of the company, is saying here in the statement, he says after customers implement large amounts of recently shipped product, we expect to see product order growth rates accelerate in the second half of the year. So you said there's going to be questions about yeah. the second half of the year. Getting a little bit of hints of what we might hear from Cisco in that commentary. He also says we are committed to delivering operating leverage and increasing capital returns to our shareholders. Uh, but, you know, at least the first blush reaction here on the part of investors is not reassured uh, by that uh, that commentary on looking a little bit further ahead. Um, sticking with earnings, we want to turn now to Palo Alto, of course, the big um, cybersecurity company. Those shares, too, are trading lower by some almost 9% as well. In the case of Palo Alto, just running through some of the numbers here, uh, the company's first quarter earnings per share, it says, at a buck thirty-eight revenue uh, coming out a little bit better than estimated, $1.9 billion versus estimates uh, a little bit um, below that. But here, too, it is the forecast that is the problem. Second quarter billings, the company says, will be $2.34 billion to $2.39 billion, $2.43 billion is what analysts had estimated. Before we get too bogged down in all the numbers, the bottom line is here, first quarter beat, second quarter yep. forecast, lagging estimates. And this stock market had a monster run heading into this print. It was mm. up more than 80% this year heading into this report. But, you know, investors paid close attention because of what it tells you about the security software space, the general IT spending backdrop. Lots of fans on the street, by the way. I mean, the, the, more than 85% of analysts who cover this name have a buy on it. Mm. Um, zero sales. I think we got to get Dan Ives over at Wedbush um, online. He is a big fan of this company. It's one of his favorite cybersecurity names to own in part because he believes, listen, there's a $200 billion growth opportunity in cloud security, and, and Dan just think they have the services to help win a big portion of that. But investors right now, at least at first blush, we always do want to wait for the call, see what the yeah. execs have to say, but at first blush, you're disappointed. I mean, Akesh Awara, the chairman and CEO of the company, sounding a very optimistic tone in the release, at least in one way. He says an unprecedented level of attacks is fueling strong demand in the cybersecurity market. Certainly, anecdotally, we have been seeing those attacks. Um, and some of the other cybersecurity and cybersecurity adjacent companies we've been speaking to are optimistic on that front. They say people need our services. Um, so we'll have to dig in a little bit more here to see exactly what's going on with Palo Alto. Right. Two there to watch in the after hours, yeah. for sure. Coming up with the war in the Middle East in its second month, corporate America and college campuses are focusing more on diversity, equity, inclusion policies. We're going to talk to an expert in the DEI field. That's next.
the war between Israel and Hamas stretching into its second month, and the ripple effects being felt here in the United States, including on college campuses and in corporate America. The situation, the latest example of how diversity, equity, and inclusion policies have become more complex in offices around the country. Joining us now is former director of inclusion at Netflix and author Michelle King. Michelle, first of all, thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate your time. Um, this is a topic that we, people have been talking about, um, and we've heard a lot of sort of people in corporate America and corporate America adjacent speak out about saying, if people say certain things about the war, we're not going to hire them, et cetera. How do companies need to approach this? Look, I think even current approaches to diversity, equity, and inclusion largely haven't worked. And I don't say that lightly. A 2020 McKinsey study showed workplaces have become more diverse, but less inclusive. So what we're really seeing is that employees aren't sort of feeling valued for their differences. And this really impacts organizations. You know, we're in environments where employees feel included, they're six times more likely to innovate. And so the challenge we've got today is, while we may have a more demographically diverse workforce, we're not valuing those differences to really enable innovation, creativity, and ultimately to drive sort of a competitive approach to how organizations run. And so we have to really try and focus on how are we managing the lived experience of employees? Do employees feel like they can be themselves, be valued for that? Do they know how to have difficult conversations, give and receive feedback? And for me, all of that comes down to leaders. There's a wonderful Catalyst study that shows 46%, 46% of employees' experiences of inclusion are directly attributable to their line leader. Leaders play a disproportionate role in employees' mental and emotional well-being. Up to 75% of stress is also attributed to a line leader. So if we really want to start sort of valuing the diversity we have, we have to help leaders create environments where employees feel included and can have some of these difficult conversations. And Michelle, you know, the ADL, the, the Anti-Defamation League, um, in the wake of, of the Hamas terrorist attack, has asked companies across the country to sign this workplace uh, pledge to fight anti-Semitism, um, to be aware of anti-Semitism, to support their Jewish employees. If you were still at Netflix, Michelle, would you advise the company to sign that? Yeah, look, I mean, I can't sort of specifically speak to Netflix or to policies on the war. I'm a workplace um, expert. I look at how you build cultures that value difference. I think what every organization needs to do is think about what is the lived experience of all employees, regardless of their religious um, orientation, and look to value those individual differences. And so for me, that really starts with helping employees understand how do you do your job in a way that's inclusive? You know, if you are sharing aspects of, you know, challenges that you're encountering, how do you do that in a way that's respectful and also manages the impact you may be having on the people that you work with? You know, culture is 10 times more predictive of retention than pay. And that's an MIT study. So we really have to look at, you know, how are companies creating environments where people can have these difficult conversations, but in a way that's respectful. And that goes for all sides, regardless of sort of what an individual's um, particular sort of perspective is. Um, Michelle, it, it feels as though in the wake of the pandemic, initially there was sort of a push to increase DEI uh, programming and leadership in corporate America. And it feels like since then we've had sort of a fall off. Is that your impression? And, you know, do you think it's just not urgent enough at this point? So look, I think there's a tremendous amount of backlash and fatigue with diversity, equity, and inclusion. Companies spend in the United States about $8 billion a year on DEI initiatives, yet at any one point in time, roughly 40% of employees feel isolated, excluded, devalued. So my big sort of case to corporate America is, look, we're not actually managing the lived experience, which is what matters. So yes, you know, creating environments where you're hiring and promoting people from sort of demographically diverse backgrounds, great. But what are you doing to ensure those employees feel valued, feel like they can contribute? What are you doing to meet their needs? What are you doing to create psychologically safe environments? So I think the challenge is for a lot of organizations, you can have all of these initiatives, all of these policies, but if you're not fundamentally changing how an employee is experiencing the organization, you haven't created an inclusive environment 
environment and everything companies want when it comes to innovation, productivity, even safety or ethical decision making, you know, the ability to be competitive, all of that is on the other side of managing culture. And the problem is the pandemic really highlighted this. We've got a lot of leaders who are leading in that 1950s sort of industrial era transactional command and control way. When our context has changed, we need leaders who are democratic, caring, empathetic, who can have hard conversations, who can give and receive feedback, who can delegate, who can manage a hybrid and environment. And that is a lot harder to manage from a culture perspective. And unfortunately, what we're seeing is we just don't have the leaders we need to manage and create these types of environments. All right. A trend to watch there. Michelle King, thank you for joining us. Thank you. And coming up, more people are applying for mortgages as rates come down, but will prices follow? We're going to break that down next. Mortgage demand is rising as inflation cools. Applications hitting a five-week high. New data from Mortgage Bankers Association showing demand rose about 3% last week. But as another Fed rate hike looks more and more unlikely, does this mean the housing market could be ready to get a boost? Joining us now is Daryl Fairweather, chief economist over at Redfin. A new report from the firm says an 8% mortgage rate won't be seen anytime soon. So, Daryl, great to see you, and I'll, I'll let you answer that question. Is this the is this the kickstart the housing market needs? It will kickstart some people back into the housing market, but it's not going to be a major turn of events. We may just see a few more people decide that 
now is the time to make a move and lock in a rate, but mortgage rates are still substantially higher than they were last year. Sales, sales are still down. So I think it's going to be a slow recovery. Do you think, Daryl, that mortgage rates have peaked? I certainly hope so. I mean, anything could happen with new data prints, but it's good to get some good news. Hopefully we continue to get more good news about inflation cooling, and that continues to be good news for mortgages. I mean, when we look at history and we look at other mortgage rate cycles where we've seen a big increase in rates, how long do buyers tend to wait, right? I mean, it's difficult to time this stuff, but do they wait for a half a percentage point decline? How does it sort of tend to play out? It depends on what situation the buyer is in. If the buyer is debating whether to rent versus buy, it's still going to be more affordable to rent in most of America compared to buying. And if a homeowner is considering whether it's a good time to sell and move again, it depends on what the price point is of their next home. If they're downsizing, then these rates don't matter so much because they can use their equity to pay more in cash. But if they're upgrading to a newer, more expensive home, then these rates matter a lot and any little movement is going to have a big impact on their budget. And Daryl, sometimes what you'll hear people, they'll make the argument that what's gonna break us out of this impasse here in the housing market is just life, life events. People, they get married, they get divorced, they have kids, the kids go off to college. Um, is that enough, do you think, to kickstart the housing market? I think that life events tend to happen sporadically, so I don't think it's the kind of thing where all of a sudden everybody is getting married or getting divorced at the same time. It's going to be more of a slow trickle of people deciding that, you know, I can't wait any longer and I want to move. But a strong economy does mean that more people are moving for job opportunities. They feel more confident. They feel like even though rates are high, they can make it work for their budget. So that's a positive is that the economy is still quite strong. Daryl, I wanna um, go back to something that you guys wrote about recently, the so-called Nepo homebuyers, right? That we were seeing because of the affordability problems, we were seeing homebuyers, particularly first time homebuyers, get help from family. Um, is this a big change compared with history? You know, are more home buyers needing to get that kind of help? Sort of put it in perspective for us. What's different now is that mortgage rates are very high and prices are very high. So if you're trying to scrap together a down payment, it is very difficult. And the more of a down payment you can put together, that means the lower your monthly mortgage payment is going to be. So if you only have enough money to put 5% down, that means you're going to have a really big monthly mortgage payment. But if you have help from family and you can get to 20% or you can get even above 20%, then that means that that monthly payment is going to be much more affordable to you. So having that help, having somebody to give you a cash gift, is a huge is a huge advantage in a market like this. And Daryl, you know, part of what, what we're dealing with here is limited inventory. Do you think, just as an economist, that regulators and lawmakers should be doing more, could be doing more to um, increase inventory, increase supply? Absolutely, and it's not that so much that lawmakers need to intervene in the market. What they really need to do is to make it so that these zoning laws aren't so restrictive. We need to actually decrease the regulation on builders so they can build more dense housing, especially in places where land values are high, because that's where the jobs are, that's where the amenities are, that's where everybody wants to live. And it doesn't make any sense that we restrict that supply by only allowing for single family homes. Is there any movement on that front? Yes, there's been a lot of movement in places like California, Montana, Florida, across the whole political spectrum to rezone. And then we're also seeing some other creative tax policies like in Detroit and in Minnesota to tax land instead of the properties so that that encourages more development because then you're not being penalized for building more homes. And finally, Dara, I want to get your take on, on a separate issue, which I know you've written about, you've researched and reported that a lot of young Americans receiving family money to buy a home. What are the trends you're seeing there? Well, about 40% of people under 30 received help from family, either a cash gift or an inheritance to buy their home. And what's so important about understanding that is that people whose parents were homeowners, they existed in a different time than right now. They may have had advantages and had um, programs that helped them that younger generations didn't have. So the historical uh, context matters. And I think we need to make the, the playing field level for young people today so they don't have to rely on having wealthy parents or homeowner parents to get their foot in the door into the housing market. 
Daryl, good to catch up with you as always. Daryl Fairweather, appreciate it. Thank you. Well, the beef with baby boomers about the housing market could be subdued for now. Data from Ned Davis Research shows that millennials are the reason behind high home prices. Let's bring in Yahoo Finance's Danny Romero with more. I got We got to tell Brad Smith this because he keeps pointing the finger at the baby boomers for the lack of affordability. Tell, so let's let's turn it back to the millennials, please. <laughs> Julie, the blame game continues. Now millennials are under the microscope. Fresh data from Ned Davis really shows us that millennials are leading the household formation, which means more housing demand. And it also says in this research too that the generation, this generation's household footprint will continue to grow at the end of this decade. So that further highlights other data from Redfin that shows that millennials make up the largest share of the home buying pie right now. But there are several factors that are weighing down the market right now. High home prices, low inventory, housing affordability is getting worse. And so the U.S. is short of 2.1 million housing units currently. And Ned Davis Research found that they pointed out that home builders are unlikely going to increase housing production anytime soon, given the fact that financing these projects have become expensive. And even if they do add more inventory to the market, Millennials just make up too much of that share. Uh, but there is a counter argument to this. Uh, Barclays, just recently in September, I spoke with their housing team and they said that unlike the baby boomers, the younger population is a lot less smaller than the baby boomers. So there is upside for the younger generation to get into a home, but obviously that depends on the dynamics of the housing market right now and with high home prices and the mortgage rates where they've been headed. Obviously, that's dampening that. As usual, Gen X is nowhere in the discussion. We always get left out, either <laughs> being blamed or thanked for whatever it may be. I mean, so I, I guess, so are we blaming millennials for this, or are we saying, like, this is going to be a problem for them when it comes to affordability, or both? I think it's both. <laughs> it really is the both, right? But yeah. it's like as time moves on, right, we're the next age group. I'm a millennial, so this is really, you know, I'm feeling this pressure mm -hmm. too. But it also, I think it's really important to highlight that the wealth gap is widening between the baby boomers and the millennials, right? right? The baby boomers, the older baby boomers bought their home when mortgage rates were around 18%, the older ones we're talking about. Uh, and they've already refinanced probably a couple of times right now. And so that's a disadvantage, obviously, in the current space that we're in for millennials. And I know we were talking about how the young generation is struggling to somewhat pay for a down payment. I was actually seeking my parents to help me out with Ooh. a down payment. So it's really correlated to even personally to me. And even with that help, my monthly payment would have still been really yeah. high. What I, was trying <laughs> to get, what I was trying to get to, though, sort of with Daryl is, I don't think that that is unusual, even historically. No, I don't but think But I don't so. know if it's quantifiable, if we know right. how many people are asking for help. Certainly we know what the affordability is, which is worse. But I just wonder how that how that is all shaken out. Well, my parents didn't have help. I mean, they're the baby boomers. They didn't have help, essentially. Mm -hmm. But they are definitely willing right now because they see what's going on. Mm -hmm. But again, you know, when they were buying homes, it was a lot, it was a different market too, yeah. right? So I think that's a good perspective that you bring. I don't think it's uncommon, but I think that it's something to high people are highlighting right yeah. now. Yeah. yeah, I think my big takeaway is I, I just have to hit up the old man a lot harder. Is that's that, what I got out of this. Is that what you, I, I thought you just can't find a house. Well, now, now, I mean, yeah, he maybe has to chip in a little bit. Julie, we're finding right. the reasons on why he can't find that. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Danny, thank you for that. Appreciate it. As part of Yahoo Finance's week-long healthcare special, we're taking a look at the progress in mental health support. Roughly 50 million Americans in 2019 and 2020 were experiencing, uh, experiencing a mental illness, according to Mental Health America. But as interest rises in mental health wellness, we're digging into how workplaces are handling the new age of mental health. To break down the latest progress and barriers in the mental health space, Yahoo Finance's Anjali Kamlani spoke with John Crable, Corporate Synergies Group Senior Vice President. Take a listen. I think some of the social stigma has gone away from 
you know, the whole concept of uh, individuals saying that they could use support or help. And I think that there's a greater demand from the employees to their employers to provide, you know, additional resources and avenues for support and help. We've seen definitely the rise of things like apps, uh, wellness apps in particular, or telehealth visits uh, through virtual means, uh, and, and connecting in some cases to in-person appointments. What would you say is the most valuable thing for employees right now that employers could do? Um, well, I, I think you really outlined it, which is to provide kind of a multi-prong approach for employees to access uh, mental health support and resources. So that could be, you know, apps like Calm or Headspace that allow employees to, you know, kind of self-manage, but also it's really giving them access. It's creating avenues to uh, talk to mental health care professionals and providers. When it comes to the expense of this right now, we're talking about this in an era where increasing premiums, increasing employer burden of that continues to be a topic of conversation. I'm sure you're hearing that as well. And so I wonder how adding all these additional services, uh, you know, uh, contributes to that bloat conversation. Yeah, you know, that is a good point. And that is a that's a challenge that that employers face all of the time. Uh, you know, they they all generally provide basic, you know, health care and prescription coverage and maybe some other lines of coverage. But really kind of bolstering that with mental health support and other things is very important. The good news is, is that with some of the online, the digital platforms, as you mentioned, and virtual care, the cost is more manageable. And also we're seeing a greater investment from the healthcare. care carriers themselves, the big insurance carriers, are also expanding kind of their offerings and support, recognizing that this is, um, you know, an area that that is in high demand right now. Do you think that there are still too many avenues uh, where there's no coverage right now? Are, are the offerings kind of limited, maybe, into what is available? I think the biggest challenge um, that employers and individuals face in, in either providing or obtaining a mental health care support uh, are the providers and the limited providers. Um, the good news, again, is that the digital platform allows quicker access because you now don't have to work specifically with a provider in your exact geography. You can meet with someone on the West Coast if you're on the East Coast. But that... It is certainly still a challenge. And then finally, when we're talking about this space, obviously leaning heavily into the digital side of things, a lot has been sort of employer pilot programs or you know, trying to get the buy-in of the employers. You mentioned that we're getting more buy-in from the traditional players. What remains the barrier there to maybe more adoption? Is it just the scale that these platforms are able to provide? Yeah, I, I think it I think you really touched on a lot all the challenges, which is you know associated cost, right? So so there's that. There is um, the ability to uh, provide access. And I think the other one is still, you know, helping their employees get over the stigma because they can offer the product, they can offer the programs, they can offer the platforms. But if the person is still not comfortable saying, hey, I need help, or um, you know, I just need to talk to someone, then the employer can offer everything. If it goes unused, then obviously it's not supporting that person. That was John Crable and our own Anjali Kamlani as part of our healthcare series. And be sure to tune in tomorrow for more of Yahoo Finance's special healthcare week. Coming up, Warren Buffett's $8 million bet on Major League Baseball. We've got the details next.
Welcome to Yahoo Finance's group chat. And today it has been buzzing with business stories about sports. And I want to start with Warren Buffett taking a bet on the Atlanta Braves, Berkshire Hathaway buying in an $8 million stake in that now publicly traded MLB baseball team. Guys, the biggest takeaway for me there was just professional sports getting the stamp of approval from one of the most famous investors, right? When Berkshire buys something and they get into a new industry, it normally just stirs up interest generally. And I think that was sort of the biggest initial reaction I had is, all right, Warren Buffett said it's cool to invest in sports. Yeah, now it's a very small stake when you think about all of the holdings in Berkshire Hathaway, when you think about all the money that Warren Buffett has. It's not entirely surprising, though, because Buffett has been a longtime investor in Liberty Media, which used to be the parent company of the Braves. Uh, So, you know, there's that relationship there as well. It got me thinking, though, why we don't see more sports teams that are publicly traded. And I wonder if that's a trend that could continue if the Oracle of Omaha is investing in sports. I'm sure a lot of other people would like to invest in sports. I'd love to invest in the Eagles or the Phillies <laughs> or, you know, Only my favorite sports teams. team. Only, Only Philly, Philly teams, obviously. But that's something that I wonder if that could happen in well, the future. It, yeah, in, in the States, at least, it's much more common in Europe for sport for mm-hmm. football teams, right. to, football, soccer teams to be public. In the States, it's more about vanity ownership, rich people buying teams. And uh, the Braves are an anomaly here with that with that public float, you know, owned by Liberty, which is owned by John Malone. I'm not sure if Malone had an interest, interest in the Braves before it was sold from Ted Turner. But uh, all that being said, Buffett never passes on a good trade. He, he probably saw the numbers, see the, see the deal, see the, the skyrocketing values of sports teams and their media rights accompanying those teams. Atlanta is not the best market, but it's a big market. The Braves are a great team, great young talent. Won the World Series, yeah. 2020. Right, right, Mm -hmm. right. So I wonder if, I don't know if that really plays into Buffett saying, hey, they got a really good shortstop uh, of profit in the or whatever, you know. So I'm not sure what's going on there, but it's a great trade. He probably loved it. $8 million is like literally slivers of a penny to me. Like it's like Mm -hmm. nothing. Yeah, it's like a fun sports gamble that we would do, right? When you think about the overall, (laughs) it's like a little, it's a little bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the Braves are an interesting team too when you think about what they're doing outside the stadium. They're one of those teams that's building restaurants, investing in real estate a little bit outside the stadium, sort of that modern sports play Mm -hmm. that we've been talking a lot about private equity getting involved in, right? So private equity has been increasingly interested in a lot of these sports teams and say the Dodgers, the Red Sox, and a lot of other MLB teams. So it makes sense that you see big investors also sort of want to get in because as Pross said, those those valuations. And a lot of Wall Street money with team Steve Cohen with the Mets and developing that area. Uh, I think the Eagles owner is a a financial guy. Is it Lurie? I'm not sure if it's it's a guy. Jeff, Mm. yeah. Big Mm. big financial guy. And and of course the Red Sox. Mm. The uh, learner, right? No, and sports are only going to continue to be an important element when you think about all the streaming players and media players. We have the NBA rights renewal deal coming up that's going to be a big driver Mm. in media as well. And sticking with that theme, Netflix took a swing at live sports broadcasting last night. I was watching. I tuned in for about about 25 minutes of the <laughs> live Netflix Cup. There are a couple things that stood out to me. They really wanted this to be a behind the scenes look. They wanted you to see the players interacting, talking, really leaning into their personalities. They also really touted a lot of their own programming. So the new Squid Game reality show, they heavily incorporated that into the broadcast. They even played a game with the players where they had to swing their bat before the killer Squid Game robot turned her head around. So gimmicky, but you know, pretty light, pretty fun, I would say. Say. The big question, though, is who was the audience here? And I'm not quite there sure. I'm there not quite sure one. that. Like, was, long term, no. if you were to keep doing this, I just don't see, like, who the audience is. Yeah. One off, sure, maybe people check it out. You watched it for 20 minutes to see what was going on. You realized it was more of a swing and a miss. And yeah. you're probably not going to go back if they were to regularly do it. So I, I don't know, Pross. I don't really see this being a thing that Netflix is going to do. Right. Well, I don't know if you saw my hard-hitting interview with Roy McElroy from the Austin <laughs> Grand Prix, where he invested in the Alpine F1 team. Uh, Esteban Ocon and Pierre Gasly, who played in that match, mm-hmm. had a little fun putt-putting there in front of the uh, team hospitality. But yeah, it's a weird event. It's kind of strange, but it's kind of like these non-core sports like golf and, and F1 racing in this country. Maybe they got to merge together to sort of get some get some sort of uh, attention. And like you said, uh, for Netflix, get some promotion for their other other endeav- endeavors. Plus, also it's sort of like Golf params have been around forever, and this yeah. is like not that different from that. No, right? it was like after the COVID stream with Brady and who was Brady and Manning, right? Was the first one we right. got like, we yeah, got like obsessed with mm-hmm. miking up famous people and watching them not be that good at golf. <laughs> I, I, I just don't need to do it. But I'll that, go play bad golf by point. myself. I, I think the point was to lean into oh, you know, this is 
amateur hour in a sense, but yeah. I feel like that was the goal. Yeah, they gamified it a yeah. little bit more. They had the red light, green light, which was interesting mm. from Squid Game. So I, I did like that piece of it. Yeah. Uh, you know what? Let's swap the old golf clubs for some a real sport like F1, like I mentioned, right? Like I mentioned, <laughs> uh, the Vegas Grand Prix, Grand Prix almost here, it, but it may not be living up to the hype. We're looking at sort of things like ticket prices and and also prices for hotel rooms. Uh, uh, we saw some 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 figures here that uh, I think it's Tick Picks, Ali. You mentioned this yeah. before. Tickets for the race from eight hundred dollars, sorry, sorry, from sixteen hundred to half that eight hundred bucks. Seen a lot of VIP uh, hotel packages getting cut in half, you know, 10 grand package now for 20% for of that. Um, you know, look, F1 has made a major investment here, over $200 million in facilities just for this race alone. They have a 10-year contract for this race. So it seems like they may have oversold their hand here in terms of what they thought the return would be for this race. They were targeting really big spenders, international travelers, um, F1 kind of rides in a very uh, uh, she crowd, mm -hmm. and I think that they may have oversold that hand, right? And then I think they're they're discounting the people that are true fans that wanted to come to Vegas, have a vacation, watch the race. Yeah, and I do think there was a lot of overhype when we think about F1 and what it could be, especially after the success of Drive to Survive, but we've seen TV viewership on a decline mm -hmm. year over mm -hmm. year. It's still a lot more than it was, yeah. but we're seeing that uh, you know, that allure of F1 sort of fade a little bit into this race. And it just feels like a swing and a miss for Vegas and those hotels. There was, in Bloomberg was reporting that Wynn had held, Wynn Resorts had held some rooms for people to get into Wynn and basically pay more. And those rooms never got filled, so they have less money coming in there now. It'll be interesting to see how that plays out when the Super Bowl mm. comes to Vegas. Yeah. A lot February. of things in Vegas these days. A lot of things in Vegas. Oh we got to go look at flights. Yeah. But coming up next, we're going to bring you the stocks that are moving after hours. That's coming up after the break.
Let's take a look at some of the trending tickers after hours. Uh, I guess we'll start with Cisco here. We told you the company cut its full year profit, full year sales forecast, I should say, and the stock has been falling sharply in after hours trading. Uh, the company's conference call has begun by now, and in fact, the, the clients have accelerated in after hours trading. It's now down by 11%. Chuck Robbins, the CEO on the call, well, just a couple of comments to bring you from that call. He said lead times for products are back to normal and that component shortages are mostly behind the company. He said he's they're not immune to macroeconomic factors, but the primary issue, he says at Cisco, is onboarding product orders. He continued fell 21% in the first quarter uh, thus far. So uh, just a couple of uh headlines, early headlines from that Cisco call. We are also watching shares of Sonos, the speaker company. Not much change in after hours trading. Interesting because the company's fourth quarter revenue fell by three and a half percent. That was a bit of a smaller drop than estimated here. Uh, the company also said that its 2024 revenue will be 1.6 to 1.7 billion dollars. Uh, that leaves it room to miss analyst estimates. Patrick Spence, the CEO, in the statement saying he's posi they're positioning the business to return to top and bottom line growth when conditions improve. That doesn't really um, indicate a lot of optimism on the part of Sonos about when conditions are indeed improving. And I guess we're checking on some solar stocks as well here. Uh, Maxius, Maxion and so SunPower. Uh, Maxion reported its earnings um, and the company also uh, coming to some kind of agreement with SunPower or after a dispute that the two have been having over components. Time now for what to watch on Thursday. Investors can expect to hear more on the state of the consumer. Walmart, Alibaba, and Macy's all set to report quarterly results before the opening bell. And after the market close, Ross Stores and Gap will report their earnings. Turning to the housing sector, Home Builder Confidence Index will be out for the month of November. That report coming after confidence fell in October to the lowest level since January amid sky-high mortgage rates. Investors will also be watching a load of Fed speakers, including John Williams and Loretta Meister. Well, that does it for us and today's Yahoo Finance Live. Be sure to come back tomorrow at 3 p.m. Eastern for all of your coverage leading up to and after the closing bell. Have a good night.